I really want to congratulate uh, John and Cyril for having brought together um, the world leaders, uh, the three world leaders who've, uh, whose trials uh, have shaped the way that we think today. So certainly in, in, uh, in so many areas of diabetes and, uh, and cardiovascular disease. So um, with, with, um, with, without any further ado, let me introduce Dr. Herzl Gerstein. Herzl is uh, probably um, one of the University of Toronto's uh, greatest alumni in the present era. And so it's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce him as the person who has, I think, put, uh, put uh, Canada on the map for, for, uh, for leading trials in diabetes and cardiovascular disease with an immense experience and um, uh, for one so young. <laughs> you just, I'm going to take you home, David. That's, a, that's superb. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, I see some familiar faces from many years ago, and uh, I do originally, I grew up and went to university here, as, as David said, so it's, it's great to be here. And so I'm going to be speaking on this topic is why we need large, pragmatic outcomes trials of nutritional interventions. Now, there haven't been a lot of them. There's one that we're going to hear about um, later on this morning. Um, uh, but I think we need them. We need more of them. And I'm going to hopefully convince you as to why we need to have these large trials. Um, this is a list of the uh, companies that I'm happy to have worked with to help improve the lives of my patients with diabetes by developing drugs and therapies for them. Uh, this is, um, uh, there's no, none, none of those actually are, 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 one of them actually was one of the sponsors here. And uh, everything I'm going to say is based on the evidence um, from um, trials and uh, from the methodologic literature. And this is very much going to be a methodology discussion and uh, um, to really impress of what the strength is of trials. And one of the important um, reasons for me to talk about this and for me to give this sort of presentation is to counter a very disturbing trend which I see now a lot and which some of you may notice and that is the trend for people to state that with all of the quote big data unquote that we now have available of our, at our disposal all of the administrative databases all of the you know randomly collected Facebook and tweeting and Twitter and all the other stuff that's, that, that's out there all the ISIS type registries and UKGP registries, we really have so much data that we no longer need to do large randomized controlled trials. The answer is just in our databases. We just have to get a fancy programmer and, and a couple of statisticians, and we have the answer to life in the universe and everything else we might want to do. And I want to show you that that is actual nonsense and is extremely dangerous and will kill people. And so that is the point of this whole presentation. So first of all, what is an outcome? I talk about the importance of doing outcomes trials in people with diabetes and in people with other conditions as well. What is an outcome? Well, I'll tell you what an outcome is not. An outcome is not a glucose level, a blood pressure level, an HSCRP, or a level of, um, or, or the response to an oral glucose tolerance test, or a glucose, those are not outcome levels. Those are, those are things that are interesting readouts for scientists who are doing research. An outcome is something that's important to your mother, your father, and the New York Times, and your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, etc. So, you know, outcomes in people with diabetes are listed on, on the slide. So these are the things that afflict patients with diabetes that are serious, and you don't have to be a doctor or a healthcare provider to appreciate that any of the things on the slide are important. So blindness, cataracts, kidney failure, uh, uh, nerve damage, pain, uh, ulcerations, heart failure, strokes, cirrhosis, um, dementia, cancers, all of these things are more frequent in people with diabetes than in people without diabetes, and or they occur more early, earlier in people with diabetes and people without diabetes. So in my world of diabetes and outcomes trials, these are the things that we're trying to mitigate, prevent, reduce, delay, et cetera. 
So when we're talking about outcomes, trials with nutritional interventions, we're talking about nutritional interventions that affect these things, not necessarily affect your glycemic response or other things. That, that may be a mechanism, but that's not the outcome what we're interested in preventing, reducing, delaying. Um, what are risk factors for these outcomes? Well, you know, outcomes occur and we say, well, why did somebody die? You know, why did they have a heart attack? Why did they have a stroke? So we need to do research to understand what increases the likelihood of these things from happening and from not happening. And I'll show you in a minute that, that some types of research are excellent for identifying risk factors for these outcomes. And on the slide is a list of the risk factors for, um, I, I'm, this is not exhaustive, there are many things missing from this slide, but this is a list of a number of important risk factors. All of these are shown to uh, influence and predict a higher, a higher incidence or an earlier development of all the outcomes that I led earlier on. And different ones are for different outcomes, obviously, but age, Age is the best risk factor for anything. Age is a risk factor for death. Age, the older you are, the more likely you're to die, right? Um, uh, so um, diabetes duration is a surrogate for age, but it is also in and of itself a risk factor. Dysglycemia, meaning an elevated glucose level, that is a risk factor for almost all of the outcomes on the previous slide. So, um, and I'm not gonna show that data, but the higher the glucose, the higher the risk, and whether or not you have diabetes, if you have diabetes, the higher the glucose in diabetic patients, the higher the risk. Um, your insulin levels in, uh, is a risk factor as well. People with a higher insulin level have a higher risk of outcomes. Um, and I'll come back to that, et cetera. I'm not gonna go through all this list, except to point out one other very important one from a public health perspective. There's absolutely no question that smoking is a risk factor for many, many bad outcomes. But a prior outcome, the biggest risk factor for anything is having had it before. So the biggest risk factor for stroke is a previous stroke. A fracture is a previous fracture. Not only that, the biggest risk factor, uh, uh, pardon me, a big risk factor for an outcome is a different outcome. So if you have had lots of myocardial infarctions, you're at higher risk of fractures, for instance, than if you've never had a myocardial infarction because there's comorbidity that goes back and forth. Um, now, some of these outcomes are potentially modifiable. Some of these risk factors, pardon me, are potentially modifiable. And a lot of outcomes research, a lot of trials, and diet is not on this slide, but should have been, I guess, for this presentation. But, but diet is modifiable as well. And a lot of, a lot of you know, trials are looking at modifying something that we think is related to the, to the outcome, seeing if we are reducing, delaying, or preventing the outcome. So why do we need to do these trials? Why can the big data that I alluded to already not answer the questions for us? After all, there are terabytes and, uh, of data just, just floating around all over the place, not just the National Security Agency, but many other people have this data, and you know, why can't it be analyzed to give us these answers? So really, the way to flip this around, the question is, what can big data do really well, and what can big data not do? So big data, which means anything except a controlled randomized trial. So big data includes epidemiologic studies, it includes you know, administrative databases, anything except a, a large controlled outcomes trial. Big data can really nicely identify risk factors. And what is a risk factor? A risk factor is any measurement that you make that in its presence, the outcome is more likely to occur or earlier to occur than in its absence. For instance, blue eyes, are a risk factor for malignant melanoma. So people with blue eyes are more likely to have malignant melanoma, to develop malignant melanoma in the future than people without blue eyes. So anything, risk factor tells you nothing about cause, it tells you nothing about, um, uh, about mechanism, it's simply a measurement of any sort that is associated with a higher likelihood or earlier likelihood of an outcome. And big data is wonderful at identifying risk factors. It's perfect, it's like the best way to do it. You do a large study, you find things are related to each other. But are the risk factors culprits? You know, do blue eyes cause malignant melanoma uh, in the skin? Um, and um, and the, that is the question that big data is hopeless. In fact, cannot answer the question um, uh, with very rare circumstances, with very rare exceptions. And so the reason it can't answer the, answer the question, because even though there is a relationship between that risk factor and that outcome, you don't know if that relationship goes directly from the risk factor for the outcome or if it goes through something else. Because in the example I just gave you, for instance, 
blue eyes is just something that's related with fair skin. Fair skin's related with likelihood propensity to sunburn. Propensity to sunburn may be related to malignant melanoma. So anything you measure, that risk factor, may simply be linked to something which is itself the causal factor or which is linked to other causal factors. And that thing could be a, a gene, it could be a protein, it could be a dietary component, or the, uh, it could be um, a toxin, a process, a drug, a behavior, it could be an environmental exposure, it could be all sorts of things. And of course, that could be linked to something else, could be linked to something else. And that is, uh, uh, the, the, the methodologic term for that is a confounder. A confounder is just a variable, another measurement, which is linked to both the risk factor that you know about and the outcome that you're interested in understanding. That's all that the word means. And so the clever people in the room always say, well, great, you know, you're telling me what I learned in first year, you know, um, a medical school about confounders. We know how to deal with that because the smart statisticians we can make all sorts of adjustments and we can take account of the confounders and deal with them and then we can discern whether the risk factor in fact is causally or important related to the outcome and therefore whether modifying it will reduce the outcome. And my answer is yes, you can certainly account for and adjust for every confounder assuming that A, you suspect it as a confounder and B, that you've measured it and C, that you uh, measured it well because confounders are not just the ones you know about. Confounders can be measured, yeah, you know, um, so you might have measured the color of the skin in addition to the color of the eyes, but they may have been unmeasured. You might say, geez, I wish we measured the skin color in that, in that study, or you may not have even thought about it. And, they, and in fact, I can tell you that there are probably close to an infinite number of confounders, and we as humans can only measure or think about maybe 100, maybe 50. So there are always confounders you don't know about. It is impossible to adjust for the confounders. If, for instance, hip circumference is an important determinant of, of whether or not uh, obesity is related to cardiovascular outcomes and you haven't measured hip circumference and you just waist circumference, then you have a problem at looking at abdominal obesity. That, and if you haven't measured waist circumference, it's an even bigger problem. That is the issue with this. And therefore, you, big data can deceive you. So what is, so that's true. If you haven't made, and you can't adjust for them all and you won't know it, how do you get at the, how do you solve the problem? So how do you solve the problem is you change the slide. So what does randomization do? Randomization is a way to solve the problem. Now why? Now there's a caveat here. Randomization is only a useful way to solve the problem if the sample size is big enough, okay? So everything I'm saying is assuming a big sample size. If I toss a coin 10 times and I get eight heads, nobody's gonna flinch. If I toss a coin 800 times and I get, you know, uh, 700 heads, you're gonna think the coin's rigged, okay? So, so everybody, randomization is only useful with enough people, and in fact, with enough outcomes. So you need to have a big enough study, not just to have enough people in it, but you need to have about to really be confident, a thousand outcomes that you have to measure. That's why many, many of the big RCTs have 10,000 people in it. So random, you need enough people in it, and that's a very important principle. So if the sample size is large enough, what do you do when you randomize people in light of what you said? So here's what you're not doing. You're not randomizing the treatment to one group or the other. That's not the way to think about it. The purpose of randomization is you're randomizing every single one of the measured unmeasured and unimagined confounders. So you start with a group of 10,000 people and you divide them into two groups with 5,000 people that on average have each group has the exact same number and identity of confounders on average as the other group. So even the confounders you haven't thought about, you don't have to do any adjustments or anything because the two groups now are identical with respect to all the confounders. So, and then once you randomize the confounders, by the randomization process, you just arbitrarily choose to give the treatment to one group and the control to the other group, because they're identical groups. So it randomizes the confounders, it randomly distributes all of the measured, unmeasured, and unimagined confounders to create two or more identical groups, 
of which one of which is given therapy while the others get a different therapy. And that's the whole point of randomization. Now, there are little additionals to this. If, you know, why do we talk about being an intention to treat analysis, which means you have to analyze every person randomized to group A and every person randomized to group B, regardless of whether they took the drug, um, or regardless of whether they took the dietary intervention, or regardless, because if you don't analyze everybody, or as close to everybody as you can who was randomized, you're then selectively choosing people, groups that have more confounders or different confounders in one group than in the other one. And so, and the other thing people say, well, yeah, but it doesn't really tell you exactly what the thing is doing. But an outcomes trial is a, 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 a pragmatic approach to therapy. What you, the question you answer by a good outcomes trial with an intention to treat analysis is not if I give you the drug and if I, you take it every day and do everything I told you, what are you gonna happen down the line? It's if I prescribe this drug or this therapy or this diet to you, will the patient be more or less likely to have the outcome I'm interested in than if I don't prescribe this? So if I do, and that's the question that intention to treat analysis, intention to treat studies do. It's, it's, it's an intention. My intention is you take this intervention, and then in the end, are you going to be better off if that's what I discuss with you? And I put all the supports in place for adherence, et cetera, but my intention does not depend on you totally adhering to what I say to you do, um, as, as a physician or as a public health person or as an economist. And obviously, we'd love to do blinded trials because then we're totally positive that nobody is, is changing the random distribution of confounders by activities that are acting, adding other confounders. With nutritional trials, you can't do blinded ones, so you miss that. But on the other hand, when you get an outcome from a nutritional trial or, or an open trial of any sort, the answer is, okay, if I randomize you to this intervention plus all the behaviors you're going to do as a result of you knowing that you're getting this intervention, are you going to be better off than the other ones? And that's also that legitimacy as well. So I'm going to, now, so what are we, I'm going to give you some examples to show you why outcomes trials are important and why big data is misleading or can be misleading. Um, but while I remember, I just want to remember to say one other thing is that Big data can sometimes tell you about cause and therapy in, one, in one, ex one exception. And that is when the effect size is big. Okay, So when we need to do randomized controlled trials when we're looking at 50% reductions, say 80% reductions, um, et cetera. When we're looking at 500% reductions or increases, it's probably pretty obvious. You don't need to do an RCT, right? I know if I jump out of a plane, I'm going to die. I don't need to randomize people to jumping or not jumping out of a plane to know I'm going to die. If a person's got a gangrenous leg and you cut it off and the person lives, you don't have to do too many trials of gangrenous legs, you know, et cetera, or, or, or in the 40s, penicillin to cure pneumonia, right? Because the effect size is huge. But most of the stuff in chronic disease, nutrition, we're talking about effect sizes, 1.5, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, not 4, 5, or 0 0.1, right? So that, that's, what we're, that's why I'm seeing what's around. Now, what are we learning from outcomes trials? Well, here are that risk factors. Let me just spend a couple of minutes giving some examples. Um, dysglycemia um, 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 is uh, clearly something I won't spend a lot of time with. Uh, I'm not going to talk about more versus less intense glucose lowering. But one of the things that comes out is, are the trials of glucose lowering due to the glucose lowering, which is, by the way, confounded with the drugs that we use to lower glucose levels. So I'm going to talk about the drugs that we use to gl lower glucose levels. And this is the class. There are about 12 classes of drugs available to lower glucose levels in the world. And I'm not going to go through every one of them because there's no time to do this. But what I will do is just focus on two for which there's really good evidence. Let's talk about insulin first. So insulin is um, a, a Canadian, um, uh, a fantastic, a, a Canadian story. It's a Canadian legend. Um, in 1922, just uh, down the road um, on College Street, the first injection of insulin was given, and it changed the, the history of, of medical therapy forever. Uh, but since the day insulin was used to treat a person with type 1 diabetes, there has been huge controversies of insulin's benefit for type 2 diabetes. And in fact, if you do 
big data analyses, epidemiologic analyses, you will find that people who are prescribed insulin have a lifespan about equal to serious cancer. That, you know, um, you have a three to six year lifespan and people get, and in fact, insulin by every administrative database you will look at or every big data kills you. It is a bad therapy. Insulin should never go on insulin because giving insulin is associated, there's a strong link between insulin and subsequent death, subsequent amputations, heart attacks, strokes, you name it, insulin is related to it. And there has been a debate for 80, 90, 100 years, that since actually it's now 94 years, that or 95 years, that insulin should not be used to treat type 2 diabetes because it kills them from all of the big data. So how do you solve the problem? You do a randomized control trial, and we did the randomized control trial, where we randomized people who didn't need to go on insulin, um, but they were randomized, uh, they were early in their course of diabetes to one injection of insulin, 12 and a half thousand people, one injection of insulin versus no insulin. Followed for seven years, they had a lot of other risk factors for heart attacks, strokes, and deaths, so they had lots of those events, and in the end, here's the effect of insulin on all the bad outcomes that were measured. So the left group was insulin harm you, the right side of the line, insulin helps you, the event rate for MI stroke or cardiovascular death was 3% per year in both groups. Insulin has a totally neutral effect when it's tested in a randomized controlled trial. Insulin versus no insulin on MI stroke, heart attacks, deaths, um, um, uh, hospitalization for heart failure, um, uh, cancers, you name it. Insulin is not, does not cause any of those things. <laughs> Why then do all the big data say that? And, and this says that, well, if you're a doctor who sees patients with diabetes, you'll know that how has insulin been treat, managed in the last 80 years? Insulin has been withheld as a last ditch therapy when nothing else works. So the story would be the patient is in the hospital with a terminal illness, the priest walks out of the room, and the resident walks in and writes the first prescription for insulin. And it's no wonder. It's no wonder that the administrative data, but if you don't know that, if you're a, 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 an epidemiologist, you just, oh, you should never prescribe insulin. You're gonna get on CNN and you're gonna tell the world that anybody who prescribes insulin is doing experiments on patients and is killing them. And you know, when we were starting this trial, we were told that too, right? So you need to, you need to sort of have, have skepticism and see, test it objectively. So this is a good example. Here's the other example, DPP-4 inhibitors. This is a wonder class of drugs. Well, it, it actually is very interesting because they use a gut um, hormone and, and a lot of this research came out of work done by Dan Drucker here in, in, in Toronto. Um, and these are drugs that increase the levels of GLP-1 glucagon-like peptide, which is an important gut hormone. And um, there has been a lot of question as to what are the effects of these on cardiovascular events. So some guy in Italy, who everybody knows, Dr. Manami, who does, uh, who will meta-analyze anything that moves if they're walking across the street. So um, he, he did this meta-analysis of all the DPP-4 inhibitor trials. And what does he show when you meta-analyze them to see what is the effect on cardiovascular events? Each of these trials had about 100 or 200 people, maybe 400. They were all not done for cardiovascular disease. They were six months long to 12 months long. They were done to look at the effect of these drugs on glucose lowering. They collected cardiovascular events as adverse events. And my God, this drug is a wonderful drug. It reduces the risk of heart attacks and strokes by 31% according to this meta-analysis of small little trials. So they were all randomized, but they were randomized with small numbers for different reasons and not designed in a way to assess cardiovascular events. When you then take this and you subject it to a proper, well done, randomized outcomes trial, you see that the effect on cardiovascular events is total unity, no effect whatsoever. And this is now, now, now there are three of these trials that have all shown the same thing, no effect whatsoever. Two examples of why big data is an issue. And so I, really, if modern medicine today relied on big data, to, um, and databases, there's many examples where the big data has gotten it wrong. So, you know, the, the Women's Health Initiative, which is a randomized controlled trial showing that estrogen therapy to postmenopausal women is maybe not that good an idea, was, came in, was, was, was accused of being unethical to be done because of course you can't deprive women who are 55 year old of estrogen because it keeps them young and youthful and sexy and everything else, but, you know, and, and it prevents brain disease, it prevents dementia, it prevents cancers. Why? Because people who are in a higher economic status wouldn't be more likely to take estrogen replacement therapy. Perhaps. There's other reasons. But the trial shows that it was not a beneficial effect. An important example. Um, the cardiologist used to suppress extra beats all the time because, because that was a predictor, it was a risk factor for death. Well, 
the, the, the randomized controlled trials showing that when you suppress these extra beats, you actually do not reduce death. You may even increase the risk of death. And there's many other examples. Here's the best one. And, and uh, some people in the room will remember in the 60s and 70s, the NIH thought, you know, men get more heart disease than women. So, and, and you know, the big data at that time suggested, well, maybe we should give men estrogen because, you know, and, and that was a trial done. It was a, 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 the coronary drug project and it was stopped early because of harm. So, you know, you can be deceived by epidemiology. When you do randomization, you know, there's no mechanisms at all. You're, you're doing it, you're just saying, let's observe what happens. And so you have high bias with epidemiologic data and, and if you do lots of meta-analyses of small little trials, each trial has so much noise back and forth that you really don't know what's gonna happen and that a lot of random error. And then last example is insulin level. If you measure the insulin level in the blood, I mean, you all, you all measure insulin level in all the nutritional things. If you measure the insulin level in the blood, people with higher insulin levels in the blood have more heart attacks, strokes, bad things. Therefore, insulin in the blood must kill you. Well, is that true? So there was a randomized control trial, and there's many things that cause insulin to go up in the blood, including weight and many other things, and maybe it's not the insulin in the blood. Well, so there was a randomized controlled trial, NIH funded, of people with proven coronary artery disease. They all were candidates for revascularization. They all needed a, a coronary bypass or, a, or an angiogram with, 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 a, with, a, with, with a percutaneous intervention. And they were randomized to glucose lowering, they all had diabetes, glucose lowering with drugs that reduce insulin levels in the blood, and glucose lowering with drugs that increase insulin levels in the blood, with the goal to get the same glucose level in both groups. So one group got you know, glitazones and metformin, the other group got insulin and sulfonylureas, and in the end, what is the effect of lowering the insulin level on cardiovascular events in these high-risk patients? Zippo, no effect whatsoever. So another example of the epidemiology and the, and the big data telling you one thing when you actually do the trial, you say, wait a second, it's not what, 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 uh, what, what we were told by the big data. So I'm just gonna summarize now. And I really, um, uh, uh, you know, in my summary, I think uh, um, I, I want to sort of before that say, whenever I give a talk like this, I always have a question that somebody says, well, sure, that's very true, et cetera, but we can't do clinical trials or outcomes trials to test every nutritional intervention and to test every medical intervention in our patients. So, you know, we have to use big data um, and, uh, and we have to use observational studies and everything else. And, and the answer to that is, of course, there is truth to that statement. And as I said, when the effect size is huge, it, it, it's not part of this discussion. But we surely we can't have a trial to answer, answer every question. How do you deal with that? And you know, I think to answer that, I, I, I could have put this quote together. I'm quoting myself. But, 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 <laughs> but, what it, but I can tell you that I, I have to acknowledge you know, all, everything I've said, and my whole career really, uh, would not have happened had it not been for uh, David Sackett, who died about three weeks ago. And, and Dave Sackett, many of you know, was the father of epidemiology and clinical trials. He came from uh, McMaster, well, in the States originally, to McMaster. And so everything I say in this slide, especially, is inspired by him. And uh, I really think it's appropriate to acknowledge him in a, in a talk like this, in a day like this. But how do you deal with the fact that we don't have a trial to answer every question? Well, I think here's the quote. The trials that we do have can be thought of as they comprise islands of evidence, and these islands are linked by shorter and longer bridges of extrapolation, and they span oceans of uncertainty. The longer the bridge, and the farther we are from an island, the shakier the extrapolation. More good outcomes trials and outcomes research means more islands, shorter bridges, and less uncertainty, and there, but there will always be an ocean to to span and a bridge to cross. And so the point is that we, we can never fill up, we replace the whole ocean with islands, but we can certainly get more and more evidence so that we're more confident than when we're, when we're extrapolating from one that we really have an evidence base and one upon which to build the care that we do to our patients or the public health recommendations that we make. And the very last slide is, Carefully done outcomes trials are indispensable, I think, and they reliably provide unbiased estimates of treatment effect, and the proof of that statement is to a scientist is that the results surprise us. If we are never surprised by our research, we're not doing good research. Research means we should not always know the answer before we do the study. Thank you very much for your attention.